Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this part of uh, today's event. Um, hopefully, you've been making good use of the uh, AirMeet platform and exploring its functionality during the network session. And just a quick reminder, you'll be able to do that uh, again at the end of the next part of this event, which is the uh, panelist uh, session. Um, the panel today consists of a mixture of uh, cybersecurity experts. Uh, we have a member of um, one of the uh, yachting um, registers to provide some enforcement perspective. We have a crew member to provide some of the operator's perspective from um, afloat, and myself a little bit of from uh, the management side of life. The panel consists of uh, Nick Pomponio from uh, CSS Platinum, Corey Ramsam from uh, IMSA, Matthew Roberts from Riella Cyber, Peter Southgate from the uh, Cayman Island Shipping Registry, and Jury Perry, a uh, active um, crew member on board a large yacht. Um, individual bios are available through the AME platform, uh, and you uh, can uh, read up on that and understand where we come from. The aim for this session is to uh, be an informative one, um, hopefully dispel any uh, misconceptions that uh, the audience may have on, on what cybersecurity for uh, yachting entails, uh, clarify any uh, questions that you may have or, or issues that you may have, and uh, hopefully it'll be a benefit. The structure is, is pretty fluid. Um, each individual panelist will have a short slot in which they will highlight the key issues as far as they're concerned, um, and then there'll be a, a question and answer session that the panelists will host. Um, as the individual panelists deliver the highlights, and should you have any questions, please hold on to them until the end of the individual uh, presentations from the panel, uh, and then send them to either myself via the chat room or using the uh, electronic raise hand facility that Airmeet has, and then we'll try to get through the um, individual sort of questions that you may have. Um, and once the questions uh, run out or when we're ready to move, we'll revert back to the lounge and we can continue the networking sessions um, at this time. Uh, so uh, we'll start off the panel and I'd like uh, to introduce uh, Corey Ansom um, from uh, IMSA who will um, start uh, this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you, Corey. Hey, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Clive, and, and welcome to everybody who's joining us from uh, uh, different parts of the world. This is going to be a great discussion. We had a great discussion um, in the lounge talking about uh, about cybersecurity, and, and hope that continues uh, through the session. I'm going to talk just briefly about cybersecurity um, and some of the things and trends that we've seen in the industry, and just talk briefly um, about the regulatory compliance side. So when we look at cybersecurity, there's different types of attacks. You have a phishing attack, spoofing attack, the malware attacks, which include ransomware, uh, social engineering types of, uh, of attacks within networks, and then inside threats. One of the things, um, as we look at specifically the large yacht industry, um, and this doesn't carry across uh, the rest of the greater maritime industry, but the large yacht industry, the biggest attack vector that we've seen within this industry has been a man in the middle attack. And this is an attack where someone will intercept an email communication between two different parties. They'll take the identity of one of those parties um, and then divert money um, typically for a yacht charter or other business um, into um, an offshore account and off they go. So that's typically the attack vector that we see um, within the maritime industry. Um, when we talk about cybersecurity, um, our recommendation to our clients is the first thing to do is to take a look at the systems that you have on board and do just a basic vulnerability assessment of the internal systems, your firewall, and then an external penetration test to determine where are those vulnerabilities. Now, as we know, the IMO 2021 compliance has come into effect and this affects all vessels 500 tons or greater that are commercial vessels and have a flag state approved safety management system or ISM plan on board. But we like to, to talk to, to everybody within the industry that it's important not just for the vessels that have um, an IMO compliance, that all vessels should really take a look at their cybersecurity health and where their vulnerabilities are and how they uh, 
limit access to different uh, systems on board. The other piece that, uh, that we don't hear a lot about, but it is just as important to us as, uh, as doing the vulnerability assessments and the penetration testing and then monitoring those systems is crew training um, and staff training for management companies and shoreside uh, support companies. The crew training piece is so vital uh, to the overall cybersecurity when you talk about vessels um, and shoreside businesses. You can have the best firewalls and the best systems in place, but if, you're, if your crew members or your staff members don't understand those different threat vectors and click on phishing emails and launch those attacks into your system, it can be very detrimental. So crew training um, is a really big uh, part to that. I know we'll probably get questions uh, into the session more on um, IMO 2021, some of the regulatory requirements of the different flags. It's gonna be great to hear uh, from Peter and their, their position here later on. Um, but next, I would like to introduce uh, Matthew Roberts, um, and he has a really interesting perspective on, uh, on cyber. So we'll uh, pass it over to uh, Matthew. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Corey. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just gonna share uh, a part of my screen here. Before I start, I hope that's uh, visible for everyone. So uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Um, and today I would like to talk about cyber safety. Uh, but it's worthwhile highlighting some key differences between a security first and a safety first cybersecurity approach. And I'll start, I'll start with security first. And it stems from discussions that I've had over the last year within the industry with captains, ETOs, engineers, managers, and owners teams. When I've asked about IMO 2021 and the Cyber Risk Management Guidelines, what are you doing and what have you done to prepare yourselves? A common response that I have received has linked straight back to the owner, their family or their guests or even charter guests and their own cybersecurity, the, the data, the finances themselves, the, the privacy and the protection and defenses of those aspects. And I think it is very industry uh, easy in our industry to talk about IMO 2021 and talk about the owner and their cybersecurity. So when then I've gone on to explain why a security first approach centered around the owner doesn't meet the requirements of the Maritime Cyber Risk Management Guidelines, the next most common question I get asked is, so does that mean we need to do a penetration test? And I think what I'd like to debunk is that the answer is, is no. Uh, if you are yet to see in version four of BIMCO cybersecurity guidelines that were la launched just before Christmas, it says, and I quote, penetration testing is intrusive, carries more risk, is largely more expensive, and requires an understanding of networks and inventory assets. Penetration testing should be reserved for more specific circumstances and technical action. I'm a big fan of what penetration tests have to offer. There are a number of benefits, whether you're trying to ascertain specific threat vectors to a particular owner, hacker groups or bad actors that may be a potential threat against them and trying to gain access to their data or their finances through IT systems. But would a penetration test help identify weaknesses in payment controls? or in a procedure to update the navigation equipment, or even identify a lack of crew cyber awareness. That is why I commend the industry guidelines for aligning themselves with the NIST cybersecurity framework and closely matching the existing onboard culture of assessing risk by putting safety first. Cyber risks may not be physical risks and visible to the human eye, and it's difficult to fully understand and comprehend them without potential high profile events which I hope the industry you know, does end up avoiding, but it, there's, there's therefore nothing to really learn from. But in my personal opinion, I think it's just a matter of time. And there are a number of industry reports and rumors of invoice payments ending up in the wrong bank account, as Corey mentioned, or a remote update impacting a vessel system when maneuvering in port. The truth is the industry does have a gap. No yacht is exempt. No yacht has not had any risks on their IT or OT systems, or at least ones that we've worked with. And it's the risk-led approach and, and, and really harnessing the five principles of the NIST cybersecurity framework, identify, detect, protect, respond, recover, that really help vessels and their crew meet the aims and objectives of the cybersecurity resolution. Whether that's identifying your assets and the threats and the risks that are there, protection measures, and going beyond just the surface, but 
whether it's through a crew familiarization or an introductory video to explain the subject, but going further than that and challenging uh, knowledge, ensuring that the human risk is lowered, running drills uh, like you do for ISPS and beyond protection, moving on to detect, making sure you have the ability to monitor and detect anomalous events or malicious attacks. And I think the largest gap that we've seen is in response and recover. And even though the SMS is very much geared to include that type of documentation, the detail and the effectiveness of the response and recovery plans so far have, have been lacking and have required external assistance. So the safety first approach includes not just the technology, and I think that's another key differentiator. It also includes, includes the processes and the people and therefore the crew. And it's this approach that is consistent throughout the industry guidelines to meet the functional requirements of the RSM code. A security first approach centered around the owner does not achieve the same outcomes in the form of a cyber risk management plan. During a cyber risk assessment, both the IT and OT systems are assessed to identify and mitigate risks that if subject to a cyber event could pose a significant threat to the safety of guests and crew and the vessel and the environment. Whether that's the power systems, navigation equipment or communications or an IT system having a consequential impact on an OT system. But what is reassuring is that re there is a trade-off from the safety first risk-led approach because it does uncover gaps in onboard security. This could include weak user access, lack or no network segregation through VLANs or weak system security or even poor password hygiene. The result of the safety first approach meets the requirements of the guidelines whilst also improving the cyber security of the owner and guests, but you didn't need a penetration test to do so. This event is supposed to be a cybersecurity update, and my message is less of an update with anything new, but affirming the safety first approach that the vessels and their crew should be taking to prepare themselves for audit purposes this year, if it applies to them. What I would also ask is regardless of compliance, either compulsory because you meet the criteria or voluntarily, because despite not having to, you do so anyway, should these requirements be limited to just vessels that comply with the ISM code? During the Monaco Yacht Show, when all the yachts are at anchor, a sea of the most elegant and expensive assets on the planet, how many will have followed and implemented these cybersecurity guidelines? Just those that have to comply? Is that half, a third or less? Do the vessels that don't comply and haven't implemented the Maritime Cyber Risk Management Guidelines therefore pose a significant risk to you and your vessel at the next anchorage? What would happen if their OT systems were subject to a cyber event? Malicious or accidental, it's irrelevant. The cyber risks will remain until the entire industry does their part and puts cyber safety first. Thank you to the ISS for putting on a great event. I look forward to starting a discussion about cyber safety at the virtual table I'll be hosting after the Q&A. And I'm now pleased to introduce the next speaker, Nick Pomponio. Hi everyone, I'm Nick Pomponio from CSS Platinum. And I just wanted to briefly put the security and the knowledge gap into context across the board, kind of starting at the highest level. My background as in defense and intelligence, 15 years in the DOD and three-letter intelligence agencies. And if we start at the very top level, we can kind of understand what is security look like at that level and what does it look like at what we're talking today about in the super yacht level. So at the very highest level, what we're talking about are large, large organizations, thousands of personnel, huge budgets, huge reach across the globe, trying to manage cyber attacks, trying to both defend and commit offensive attacks across the world. Now, with those size budgets, with that size personnel, anything is infallible. In this case, recently, we've all seen that there was a large attack in the US, using that as an example, from Russia. Russia was able to gain access to multitudes of servers, multitudes of accounts, got into various US agencies, and exploited lots of data across the board. So just by using an example at that level, we can see that regardless of what we're trying to achieve, if you are a target, such as the government could be, there's only so much you can do to prevent an attack from happening. We go down one level from there, we start thinking about large corporate entities, whether in the US, the UK, or in Europe, Within these corporate entities, they also have large staffs, large budgets, 
Huge amounts of money is spent on blue chip cybersecurity tools, information processes and procedures in order to protect them and their clients from attack at, at that level. Even when you have that kind of budget, even when you have that kind of resource available to you, you're gonna have fallibilities in that case. In this case, we can use British Airways as an example. British Airways underwent a cyber attack that shut down the reservation system for 48 hours. If you can't use the British Airways reservation system, you can't get on flights. If you can't get on flights, flights can't take off. The amount of loss that happens just from a window that's small, shutting down the operational procedures of the business can be massive and can have reverberating effects across the entire industry. Now, if we go from a large corporate entity like that down to, let's say, a maritime instrument that is relatively large in size, shipping, for instance. Shipping, while again, they might have smaller budgets, still have generally cybersecurity officers, information security teams on board inside their organizations. The best example of that could be Maersk. Maersk has a relatively large organization compared to the rest of the shipping, has a relatively large budget, relatively large cybersecurity personnel footprint across the globe. They still are gonna be a large target of attack. With their example, they were hacked into and lost their operational capacity for a multitude of hours, 24 hours. During that time, the shipping lanes were closed. They missed their windows to, de to deliver logistics into the major ports, and they had to stop all operations. That small window of 24 hours, again, can cost billions and billions of dollars to the company itself. Now, taking from that example down to the super yacht industry, we don't see across the board in super yacht industry very large budgets, dedicated security teams. Very, very often we have outsourced IT across the board. While it may not be such a transnational threat and important operation as shipping, a large super yacht presents quite a profile to the potential criminal out there. They see it as a symbol status of wealth, could potentially have important people on board with important access to data and important access to funds that could be then utilized for that cyber criminal to use. So we have to have some sort of management system, security system on board the vessel or across a fleet in some cases that can manage the expectation of cyber criminals writ large in general, plug the vulnerabilities, do some testing, and provide some sort of response capability in case there is a problem that happens across the fleet. And that's what we're attempting to do with just some basic tools and guidelines, process procedures and training across the fleet from the security apparatus perspective. So th there's our example from a macro view. What are the misconceptions that we're talking about in the cybersecurity industry? One of the main misconceptions that we hear all the time is that cyber is an IT function. Okay, there is a IT function available. There is information that's transferred through an IT apparatus. There is communication that happens, but IT and, and cybersecurity or any type of security are completely separate functions, provides completely separate disciplines of training, completely separate types of expertise. It's important to understand the differences between the two apparatus of, of how they connect to one another. While you may be able to actually speak and communicate on board, doesn't mean you can do that securely. And it doesn't mean that you can also do that without a, a factor of someone getting into that information technology and, and utilizing it for their own purposes. So it's important for IT companies and security companies to work hand in hand to represent and utilize and meet the demands of the management, the captains, the owners, whoever is ultimately in charge of that vessel. Another piece that we have to think about is conception wise. There is a, there's a human psychology out there that says, this won't happen to me, it only happens to somebody else, we're not gonna experience a hack, we're not gonna lose any money, there's no examples of this ever happening before, where is the case studies? It's important to understand, one, it can happen to you, and it will happen to you, and it happens every single day. Every single time you get something as innocuous as a phishing email, that is someone targeting you, trying to get something out of you, whether it be money, resources, information, whatever it is. So that happens to every company out there. Now, it's, the, it, it's, it's important to understand that while you may not have experienced a breach or a hack or any, or any type of data loss, there's only a very small wall between that happening and not happening. We have to make sure that you understand that it's important to maintain security guidelines and that to understand that it could easily happen to you. It's, it's happened to everyone. It's happened to the largest companies in the world. It's happened to the largest governments in the world. It only takes the will of one criminal to try and get into your system and, and do something nefarious to your activities. 
So from a outside perspective, from an IT perspective, perhaps uh, or outsourced IT perspective, or from a management perspective, we have to make sure that whatever happens on the information side, on the security side, is not just a black hole that we, we have no idea what's going on over there. Someone watches our network. We hope it's going to be OK. If you use an example of an accountant, if your accountant manages your money, would you not also watch your account, make sure that he's not stealing money from you, make sure that he's not spending your money in means that you don't understand, make sure he's not making transfers to places that you don't want transfers being made to? The same way that you might watch your account or your funds or your money or your budgets should be the same way that you think about IT and security or, or those, those separate entities as they are. Have a direct relationship with the functions that happen on board, functions that happen in your corporate offices, and the functions that happen in your personal lives, and then you won't have any surprises that come down the pipe when some kind of attack does happen. That'll wrap it up for me. I'd just like to bring the next person. We're gonna have Peter Southgate from the Cayman Registry coming on board. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank, and thank you for ISS for putting on this session. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously we've, we've just had three cybersecurity experts uh, talking um, and I'm a, I'm a flag state um, surveyor um, and uh, not a cyber expert. Um, but obviously the IMO um, has placed an obligation on flag states to implement the cybersecurity requirements, um, you know, uh, for, for the, the maritime world. Um, so therein, therein lies a, a challenge uh, because, as you say, you have uh, flag state uh, inspectors and auditors who are not cybersecurity uh, specialists. But go, going back to the, the basics, well, you know, what is it we we are looking at as a flag state? What are we concerned about? Um, you know, from obviously from a, a phishing type uh, scenario, um, you know, and, and the types of incidents that have been described where you know money has been um, intercepted and transferred to another uh, um, account that's not really a safety issue um, and it you know but it does indicate um, a vulnerability um, and if there's a vulnerability in terms of potentially uh, people being able to access funds and access accounts then it stands to reason that there could be vulnerabilities in other areas uh, and that would lead to obviously problems with the operational technology, so things like ECDIS and uh, you know the the uh, um, automation systems on board, so it, it, it leads to a broader a broader consideration. So how are we um, as a flag state um, going to approach this? Now, uh, obviously the IMO has made it uh, it is now mandatory that you know all companies uh, that hold a documented compliance must implement procedures, and that there must be evidence of that at the first uh, documented compliance audit after 1st of January, 2021. Um, and that's obviously, we're already in that cycle um, because we are starting to carry out the OC audit. Now, of course, naturally those procedures that will be implemented um, at the company level necessarily have to be implemented on board. So when we go on board to do um, ISM audits and interim audits, intermediate audits, you know, we again, we would be looking at these policies and procedures. Now, one of the problems that, that um, I've wrestled with, is with, with, particularly with cybersecurity, there is there is a general lack of prescription. Um, obviously, the IMO guidelines are there. Um, the BIMCO guidance document that uh, Matt mentioned earlier um, is, is, is very good and very illustrative. But there is there is generally a lack of prescription. Unlike other areas that you might be expected to um, audit uh, during a, a normal ISM audit. So, for example, um, I, use, I always use an example of a, maybe shipboard operations of passage planning, for example. Now, passage planning is well defined. Um, there are you know, IMO, IMO, IMO guidelines on what a passage plan should be and what it should look like and how, you, how often you should do it. And, and there is prescription there. So, when you go on board as an auditor, it's very easy to look at the, the policies and procedures surrounding passage planning and say, okay, yeah, this is what it should be like. This is what we expect to see. Um, and therefore, um, you're, you know, you're either doing it or you're not. Um, and that's, that. unfortunately, we don't have that, um, 
that luxury, if you like, with, with cyber, because there is a general lack of prescription there. Um, another example is, you know, and I think we've alluded to it, and I think Jury may come on to this um, when he speaks, is crew training. Um, now, obviously, the ISM code requires that all crew are adequately trained. The SCCW convention provides prescription for what that training has to be. Um, but unfortunately, in, in the world of cybersecurity, there is no prescription on what a, an ETO or a, a cybersecurity specialist, whatever you want to call them on board, um, has, you know, has to be or what, they, what qualifications they need, what training they need. So this is, this is another challenge. So as an auditor, when you're coming on board, you know, you're trying to identify what policies and procedures are in place. Um, and it's very easy to say, well, yes, you know, the captain needs to have a, a master's ticket and an endorsement. Well, that's a prescriptive requirement. If you don't have it, then it's a non-conformity. Whereas with a cybersecurity context, that isn't quite so clear. You know, well, it, there's no prescription that says the ETO must have uh, accreditation with NIST or accreditation with whoever, you know, whatever cyber body there is available. So again, it, it becomes a it becomes a challenge when you are as an auditor looking at these things. Now, we, we've we've obviously wrestled with these um, these issues. Um, the but. Fortunately, there, we do see there is a solution, um, uh, and that's the ISM code itself. I mean, I think the, the ISM code, the way the ISM code is structured, provides a natural framework to assist in development of um, cybersecurity policies and procedures, and also to assist in auditors being able to verify compliance with those procedures. Now, um, if you look at the ISM code, I mean, there's what, 13 sections of the ISM code. Every section of the ISM code has a, a tool that can be readily applied to a cybersecurity context. So, for example, if you look at, um, well, just taking the fundamentals of the policy, having a cybersecurity policy in place is going to be key. Um, so we go, on, we go into a company and we say, show me the cybersecurity policy. Um, if you don't have one, then straight away there's a there's a nonconformity. Um, if they've got a, a policy, um, at least as a start, what we would be looking for, well, maybe evidence of. I mean, I'm not saying this is mandatory, but certainly engaging someone with the correct expertise, uh, such as you know my 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 former speakers uh, that were here before me. You know, to me as an auditor, if I go into a company and I see that you know one of those companies have carried out an assessment. That's going to give me a lot of comfort that there's, you know, a specialist has looked at um, the policies and procedures and has assisted in developing these. Um, but then, you know, beyond that um, is, you know, where are, where are these where are these policies? How do they filter in to the SMS, which is which is key? Um, and but and if you look at the ISM code, there are, you know, if you uh, chapter. You know, if you look at shipboard operations, so, you know, how does the ECDIS get updated? Who looks after the, you know, who looks after the updates? You know, um, how do you protect the, the, um, the ECDIS from virus? You know, and the, so, you know, as, as, although we're not cybersecurity experts, we can make a qualitative assessment by asking the right questions to, to the operatives. Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 it will allow us to identify uh, vulnerabilities and risks. So, you know, and again, with ISM code, um, the emphasis is very much on risk assessment. And I think that's really key to the whole, um, the whole process is, is for companies to identify the risks, identify the vulnerabilities, and then put mitigate, mitigating strategies in place uh, to deal with those. Um, and, you know, emergency preparedness, you know, again, it's in the ISM code, emergency preparedness, drill, practice. What happens if somebody puts a, uh, what happens if somebody inadvertently uh, corrupts the ECTIS? You know, um, then uh, what, how do we deal with that if we're in a navigation situation? So again, we'll be looking for evidence that that kind of um, thinking has been, been applied. Um, you know, reporting of hazardous, you know, we, you know, we have to learn lessons and I'm sure we are going to learn lessons. And the, the incidents that we've had of um, uh, 
you know, cybersecurity um, very much so. We have to learn from those lessons and, and we, we need to roll that out. So I think the, yeah, although, you know, we, we're all finding, I think we're agree, we're all finding our feet with this uh, to, to some extent. Um, the, the good news is we do have strategies in place um, to, uh, to be able to do this and to be able to conduct um, an effective audit of the company and the shipboard pr processes and procedures. Um, and I think, you know, as uh, after you know, the first year of implementation, I'd be very interested to have this conversation again um, and, and, and see where we are and see what lessons we've learned. So I think that's, that's about all I've, I want to say, but I'm, obviously I'll be around for some questions after, uh, after the fact. So what I'd like to do now is uh, get an operational perspective and perhaps hand over to Jury Perry, who's a, a senior deck officer on a 100 meter plus um, multi -lock. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, Clive, and good day to all panelists and participants. Um, personally, having an onboard view only to date on this matter and vessels and their crew being regarded as the easier targets, uh, the risk of cyber attacks are more prominent in today's world than ever. The technology at the forefront of most modern vessels and even more so on yachts as a growing concern as well. Before the latest IMO resolution, I'm certain that many yachts have already had some measures in, in place to counteract such events. Although listening to the experts uh, today here as well, um, there is a concern that majority of yachts don't have enough systems in place and are lacking behind compared to the uh, shoreside infrastructures. Um, in my opinion, yachts are in a unique situation as their sole purpose is to provide a safe and secure environment for their owners and guests. Um, and generally speaking, the financial support is there to ensure a high level of safeguarding is in place. My short 15 years seagoing career has taken me from vessels with very limited connectivity and technology to complete op polar opposite with connectivity ingrained within the yacht systems. And not even to mention the amount of crew personal devices that, that float about. For me personally, and I think for a lot of seafarers out there as well, the seaworthiness when it comes to cybersecurity um, is of essence on board. And apart from ensuring the obvious hardware, software, risk assessments, SOPs, protocols, and crew training that will be carried out, I can see a permit to work system also potentially being developed for um, remote access to onboard systems itself, including. Um, uh, contractors coming on board as such. Uh, for the average seafarer, this is a very novel topic. Um, guidance and simplifying this is uh, is definitely on the forefront to make crew more aware, vigilant, and have enough knowledge to raise the alarm. Train to a level as well that uh, can identify an attack and also act accordingly. Uh, it's definitely going to be something to come forward out of this. Uh, yacht crew in general, I would say, adapt and adjust their behaviors very quickly if they understand the risk, risk involved as well. At current, uh, on my current vessel, all crew joining, of course, uh, go through their safety, security, and departmental specific formalization under the ISM code. And also, the last few years as well, we've been including the topic of cybersecurity. And we do have a 20 minute video, which uh, is the Guard DNVGL. Um, that covers cybersecurity in a basic format. Uh, just listening to the experts today here as well, I can tell that uh, there are a lot more to add, and I appreciate um, many more aspects that crew will need to be familiar with in time to come and uh, as we look forward. Um, we also follow very strict, strict uh, non-disclosure agreements as far as social media goes, which uh, also eliminates some part of the exposure um, to pick out one obvious risk. I won't disclose and discuss too much in depth uh, to what my current yacht have in place and protocols we follow. And I'm sure these procedures will come about as we uh, move into um, the IMO uh, circulation coming in, into force. Um, 
this is where management companies in conjunction with the third party uh, cybersecurity specialist uh, will come into play and ensure that the yacht is at a good standard of protection and alertness. Um, I think I'm sitting here in front of a, a panel with a vast amount of experience on this topic of cybersecurity, the implementation, and also the managing of it. So I'll definitely have uh, some more questions to come as well. And I look forward to the question and answer session. So that concludes my side. So thank you very much and uh, back to Clive. Uh, thanks, uh, Jury, and thanks uh, the rest of the uh, the panel team. It was good to see such a varied sort of approach to what is a, uh, a subject, and it's actually a vast subject. And uh, we make no apologies that we haven't even begun to scratch um, the surface of the key elements. But hopefully, um, these uh, panelists have uh, planted some seeds in uh, all of your collective minds to just um, chase up, ask questions, and perhaps clarify some of the uh, the issues that you may have. From a management perspective, I think, and as, as Pete mentioned, it's it's early days, and I think it's it's a question of either a chicken and egg or the blind leading the blind. We've got the guidelines, but it's up to us, the managers, um, to implement um, fleet-wide or yacht-wide um, a, a plan that meets those um, guidelines and meets the, uh, the yardstick um, implemented or that will be implemented by the enforcement side of, of the industry, namely flag states and port state control. Um, but we haven't quite got there. There is no corporate sort of knowledge of, of what these entities are going to be looking for. So most of us are playing at the moment either a, a wait until we get clarity as, as to what the, um, the enf enforcement agencies will, will be checking, or indeed making very sort of simple plans that provide an infrastructure on which we can build on. Um, from uh, from a manager's perspective as well, there is a, there's a significant difference in how the, the yachting community approach um, these sort of compliance issues to commercial shipping. In commercial shipping, the management company will establish a set of procedures and policies in place that will be followed um, to the letter by all the vessels under their DOC and under the management with no exemption. Um, that approach does not necessarily work all the time within yachting. So we finish up having to uh, provide a management plan which um, tries to be uh, a one-cap fits-all solution, which is not necessarily what we want. We have to incorporate the requirements from the enforcement side and ensure that compliance is achieved when those plans get reviewed and at the same time take into account the varied uh, approach to cybersecurity that captains and owners may have. So our challenge as managers is to make sure that the product that we provide on board to be scrutinized by external agencies meets all those um, elements. Uh, and that is then prevaricated upon by the experience that we all gain from actual uh, enforcement uh, sessions and the results of, of audits or inspections. Um, another aspect as well that, I'm, that I want to highlight is the issue of um, the, the the trusting and the verification of the companies that will be providing um, services if requested to individual yachts and, and management companies. And um, I recall when the ISPS code came into play back in 2003, 2004, the uh, huge amounts of companies that all of a sudden cropped up offering bespoke ISPS services, when in fact, um, there was an, not an awful lot of resource or experience um, to provide those things, and, and people jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, I'm pleased to say that those companies that did so without necessarily knowing the subject matter were quickly found out. But there is also, um, I reckon, a risk of this particular issue repeating itself under cybersecurity. So one of the things I'd, I'd like to throw out there and perhaps pick up in, in either the question and answer session or indeed the networking session is what sort of accreditation uh, should we be looking from uh, companies who are providing these services? How do, we, how do we know, how do we get confidence and trust that the services that these companies are providing are actually the right ones, especially since we are not ourselves um, experts in that? 
Um, we mentioned also the issue of crew training, and I think that's paramount because we will need some element of onboard um, supervision uh, and oversight of the cybersecurity element. And whilst the uh, cyber risk management plan should have some of those elements included, it would be ideal if we could have a yardstick um, that we could measure um, those people who are given that responsibility on board uh, to ensure that they have the skill sets required um, to do the job on board. Um, we've got it in most of all the other aspects, as, as Peter mentioned, in terms of uh, crew on board. But this is a gap that I think needs to be plugged. Um, and I think the last element as a, that I want to sort of highlight is um, how real is all of this within the yachting community? And I think we need to ensure that we try and capture uh, incidents um, and threats that have materialized against the yachting community and publicize those as, as um, anonymously as possible in order to highlight that the risk is real without necessarily um, scaremongering everybody into thinking that they have to do something. Um, so, sort of those sort of um, points are my um, key sort of uh, issues when trying to ad address this um, in the sort of overarching um, cyber risk management plan and how we develop one. Um, and uh, at, at, at this stage, then, um, happy to move into the question and answer session. And I already uh, see that there's been a number of them um, already uh, been. Um, asked through the chat, um, and I'll go through them. But also, if uh, somebody else has any other questions, please do let us know. Um, I'll I'll click on I'll, I'll pick on that one from uh, Chris Stokes from Project Yachting, and he mentioned the issues on on the threshold. Um, and basically, he's asking um, why is the uh, cybersecurity requirements based on the 500 gross tons um, threshold um, and not under. Uh, and he then emphasizes and says, surely cyber criminals don't evaluate attacks based on size and weight. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and, and I don't have an answer to that other than the fact that uh, a line in the sand has to be drawn, and the IMO has decided to follow suit in most of its regulations with 500 tons. Um, I can also, as, as a manager, sort of echo those words in terms of safety. When you have um, the ISM requirements uh, apply over 500, um, and then um, mini ISM for under 500, regardless of if you're commercial or not. And I think that sort of threshold is an issue which which doesn't sit well with me and onto an awful lot of people as well. Um, any other questions um, from the panel, or I'll go and crack on with any um, anything that comes up here. Uh, Ken Hinkling has mentioned. Um, generally what is included in the OT systems and operational technology systems. And um, I'd like to invite any uh, other of the panelists to sort of help out on this. Uh, and basically also within the OT sort of inventory description, um, assess another question which uh, has dropped up from uh, Mr. Minchilio, which is um, how do you safeguard um, any sort of malicious uh, um, uh, input into your systems via the OT. So I'll open it up to the rest of the panel um, and see who picks up those two elements. Thanks. Cl Clive, if, if I may um, just come back to a few of the points before you get into that, a few of the points you made during your summing up. Um, I mean, I think the emphasis, you know, certainly from a flag state perspective and what we're looking for from the management companies has to be risk assessment. I think risk assessment is key. Um, if you identify the risks, you can then implement policies to mitigate those risks. You can identify the vulnerabilities and then and then solve them. And I think that's got to be the heart of everything. And this is where the ISM code has fortunately, um, you know, provided that tool that management companies can use to, um, you know, to, to identify their policies and procedures and you know an auditor's as you say an auditor's job is you know you tell me what you're what you tell me what you're going to do um you set out what you're going to do i'm going to verify that you are do you are actually doing what you say you're going to do and that that, that is in, that is effective and that's all we can be expected to do as auditors so i think the key thing is 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 the risk assessment and again i just wanted to come back on the, the 500 gross tons question 
um, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the line has to be drawn somewhere. You know, ISPS is uh, required at 500 gross tons, but you could do a lot of damage with a 499 gross ton yacht. So, you know, it, it is just the way that the IMO is structured. Um, but the, a lot of questions, I get, often get asked the question, what happens to the mini ISM vessels? And whilst there are no uh, mandatory requirements, we would um, suggest or strongly recommend that mini, you know, that cybersecurity filters into mini ISM. Bear in mind that mini ISM is for vessels under 500 gross tons. For those who might not understand that, but and it is meant to be a form of ISM for commercial vessels under 500 gross tons. So the risks are still there, as 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 the question uh, person who raised the question is absolutely right. So our our approach would be. We, we're not, obviously not going to be mandatory, but we would recommend that the processes that you apply for vessels over 500 filter down to some extent to a vessel under 500. Thank you. Hey, one of the things I would throw in there, too, that when we look at regulations, they're not specific to the large yacht industry. In fact, the large yacht industry most of the time gets run over by the regulations that everything has been targeted to cargo lines and cruise lines. So they've always used, you know, that natural 500 ton gross limit. And a lot of times the large yacht industry is not well represented when it comes to the IM and how the regulations come forward. We saw that with IPS and we've seen that with you know, a number of other things. So it's, it's interesting uh, to see that. And I would agree with, you know, both what you and Clive were saying earlier is the fact that I just don't look at the cyber the cyber side of it for a vessel is, you know, that's just look at the requirements. It's the overall operation of the vessel. And there's a lot of vessels that are under 500 tons that have a, a, a fairly complex and extensive networks on board um, that should be looking at the cyber health. So we recommend it, you know, across the board as something uh, for people to look at, you know, whether it's IT systems, OT, and I've seen some things in the chat um, about that. And, and and I think it was Daryl that mentioned in the chat that, you know, there was a boat that had a hot tub temperature sensor hooked up into the network so they could change that, you know, as part of an, an OT system. So it's interesting to see um, as the builds of yachts get bigger and more complex, what ends up on the network for the crew, for the crew easier to, uh, to control. Thanks, Tori. Um, another question I had um, was um, was was driven like, um, what does the panel think is the most underestimated cyber security threat in yachting? Um, views, please, on, on that particular all-encompassing question. Yeah, if, if, I, if I may, um, I, and I'll keep it brief, a lot of the guidance and the, um, what's out there to, to reference is, is very centered to the, to the yacht, the vessel. Um, I think one of the biggest external threats that is considered far less than anything else is the supply chain. Um, and it, the IMO resolution itself does call on all key stakeholders of which suppliers are one. And I think it's very easy, uh, just like I was talking about going security first and then safety first, I think it's very easy to focus in on the super yachts when we as an industry have to hold ourselves accountable to how we support those vessels and make sure that what we add to their operation is safe in regards to uh, the, the security aspects and also how they're maintained and how they're remotely accessed. So yeah, it goes beyond just the vessels themselves. The whole industry needs to do their part in order for us to achieve what, what the resolution is out set out to achieve. Yeah, yeah I'll just add to that point real quick, and I'll just say we all should do supply chain due diligence. It's a huge part of any activity operationally, our business, depending on whether you're maritime or you're in logistics or you're in aviation. But I think the biggest concern for us is people. And in this industry, we all know what the turnover is. We all know how often crews change. We all know what the seasonality is. Everybody brings their own phone, laptop, iPad on board. Everybody connects to the the Wi-Fi on board. Sometimes they connect to the one they shouldn't connect to. Sometimes they go through things online they shouldn't be doing. You know, what we have to kind of do is put some parameters in place for the people. You can and cannot do this from a security perspective. We also need to figure out who these people are a little bit better. Some of the security mechanisms we have to vet people is, is a little bit behind. These people are in close contact with very, very high level people. 
sometimes within meters of them for months at a time. So we, we've got to really understand that, you know, with anything, the human factor is the most volatile. And it's really important to make sure that the captains, first officers, chief chief engineers of the boat who have the continuity on board, make sure that the staff is coming on board, that they're comfortable with them, they've been vetted properly, and that there are the parameters and technical controls in place so they can actually do their job safely. Nick, so um, th this ties in with another question that we've we've got from the panel, and it's James Archer, a yacht captain, who's asking, uh, what is the main vector for the infiltration of malware on, onto onboard systems? Is it uh, is it people, or yeah. and, and is it crew? Device yeah, management. Device management. That, yeah, that's yeah. mostly people, and I I would agree with both what Matthew and and Nick said is that the supply chain is a hundred percent of a part of IMO 2021. So vessels need to look at those suppliers that they're using who need access remotely or on board to those critical systems and what kind of, of system and protection do they have in place. The Maerskac was a third party accounting software. And, and we see that quite a bit as, as, as you know what happens. So the people and the training are important, the supply chain is important. But to that question, the large yacht industry, unless an individual who owns a yacht is being specifically attacked, that typically doesn't happen. The majority of all the attacks so far that we've seen in the large yacht industry have been man in the middle attacks where malware was launched through a crew member opening some sort of malicious email onto the system where someone gained access to the email system and took the place of either the captain or the yacht manager and transfers of money have gone have gone um, into into hacker accounts. That's what these guys are looking for is primarily to get access to money. Um, unless they're specifically targeting an owner, it's it's financial driven when you look at the large yacht industry. Cargo and cruise is a little bit different, but this industry um, is completely almost centered on trying to grab money um, from the, the yacht charter operators, the management companies or the owners. Thanks, Corey. Um uh, another um, another element that's cropping up in the in the questions uh, via the the functionality is is crew training, and I like to uh, pass it over to to the panel and sort of, um, if possible, can you give us any sort of information on existing programs that can assist crew in becoming proficient in terms of basic cyber awareness and and cyber security. Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll just start real quick, um, and we can all go into our own bespoke training. I'm sure all all the different cybersecurity providers here have their own. Hey, put your crew in a room. I'm going to come teach them how to do stuff, and of course we all provide that, and we can probably gloss over that because that's going to be an important aspect from a governance perspective and a training and procedures perspective on on individual yachts, of course. But there's all kinds of stuff out there as far as basic level training around phishing, around malware, around things like that that is commercial off the shelf. You can get access to that as a management company, as an accounting company, as a law company, professional service, whatever you are, very easily through different platforms and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's it, if you just want to have the basic procedures and training in place to where everyone has to do a, a monthly uh, phishing attack or, or, or something like that through the corporate setting, very easy to get. We'll be. I'll be happy to tell you where to find that stuff. But from the from the TPPs, the, you know, the tactics, policies, procedures, and, and planning, and things like that, really, it's kind of important to get the captains on board, get the first officers on board, get them to understand what they are, and they can train them down. Uh, unless there's, you know, unless COVID magically goes away, and we can actually get in front of twenty people all at once in the near future. Thanks. Um, can, I, can I just just just. Uh, make a point uh, just to come back to Corey's Corey's point. I mean, yes, we, we're talking about you know attacks, but I mean, I, I think a lot of the risk is based on um, inadvertent um, introduction of things. Okay, you know, so you know, and I, I mentioned the ECTIS earlier. You know, somebody obviously you have updates for the ECTIS. Somebody you know, um, for argument's sake, picks up a jump drive that's been used for other things. Um, downloads downloads the update, puts it into the Ectis. I mean, I, you know, that, that's not quite how it works, but you know, somebody inadvertently introducing a virus into the Ectis. Somebody that might, um, you know, somebody innocently sitting ashore who's automating, um, you know, who's who's hack, you know, um, sorry, connecting into the systems on board and lo uploads a software patch. And in, you know, with a software patch, you have to you have to reboot the system. So you reboot the system, 
and it's a it's a system that is essential because the vessel's either at sea or whatever, um, and that system is is not available at a critical time. So you know, I know the, the focus are very much is on 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 hacking, but cyber has you know has a much broader context. And you know, from our point of view, from a flag state point of view, we will be looking at all kind of vulnerabilities. And you know, and also if you if if you do corrupt your this for some reason, and I keep coming back to this because that's a good example of operational technology as opposed to information technology or a computer, then um, if you do corrupt your this, how do you get yourself out of that situation when you're, you know, and you don't have paper charts as a backup and you've no longer, you've lost your navigation system. So, you know, the, these are, I, I just wanted to get away from the, you know, the, the, the sense that it's all about malicious um, activity and people trying to get your money because at the end of the day, you know, as I say, it's flag state, you know, somebody loses their money. Yes, it's sad, but it's probably not going to kill anybody. Um, whereas if you lose your ectus, you could have serious consequences. I completely agree with Peter in terms of the, the most likely uh, um, attack, I think, is accidental and non, non-malicious just by based on what cyber risks exist, exist on board. And to kind of go back to a, a point about the supply chain, it's not just about the vessels looking at their suppliers, but it's the suppliers also looking at themselves to, to, to improve inadvertently what they could do to ensure they're not a, a risk down to the vessel. And that can't just be limited to the, the um, companies and the suppliers that provide technology. It can be any company that interfaces with any of the yachts via email that could be compromised themselves, end up having a phishing link sent on, on board and compromise some systems. It, it's that easy. Um, so it's not just, they can Stability needs to be across the whole industry and to, to sort of a really reduce the, the likelihood of the, those types of incidents occurring. Yeah, I, I agree with Matt um, on that, that absolutely. And one of the things that, that we do is provide a checklist for yachts to push out to their suppliers about their cybersecurity health and, and what they're doing. And one of the questions on there um, is, has, has your system um, within your company ever been compromised? Have you ever been, um, you know, the victim of a cybersecurity uh, attack? And so it, it's pretty interesting. And that's something that vessels need to know, because if the answer to that question is yes, and a supplier that you're working with has been subject or, or they've had a system compromised, then the next question is, what have you done to mitigate that? How have you hardened your, your systems to be able to mitigate that so that as a, as a user of your tools, uh, I don't get compromised, um, like, like Matthew said, by email or by an Ectus update. We were on a boat a while ago looking at their systems and they said, hey, our Ectus is not connected to the network. There's no way to remotely access it. You know, we do updates um, offline. And as we were sitting there talking, there was a team viewer connection that was attempting to access the Ectus computer um, over the network. So right there, the vessel, it was kind of it. We started laughing. It was like, yeah, your Ectus is connected to the network because someone's trying to connect to it right now through team viewers. So sometimes even vessels, and I'd be interested to hear, you know, Jerry's point of view on this is some of the vessels don't even understand, hey, how the IT company that they've worked with has set their systems up and, and have a good idea of, okay, what is connected to the network? What is not connected? And how are the networks interconnected, you know, together? Thanks. Yeah, Corey, um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, sorry, Guy, for you saying. No, no, no. I was just trying to move away because I've just seen another another question pop up on the on the chat line, and it's uh, the question is basically: Is it true that company doing uh, assessments for cybersecurity need to be flag or class approved? To my knowledge, there isn't any guidance like that. In fact, it, it boils down to to Peter's comment about how important risk assessments are, and then we perhaps don't necessarily have um, the tools in order to provide an effective and accurate risk assessment. Um, and this is this is so crucial to the whole process in developing a cyber risk management plan, but yet it's one that we're relying predominantly on the guidelines that the IMO has issued and also our interpretation of those guidelines. And in in my experience, um, and that shared with, with our sister company, um, if you offer a risk assessment and you, you ask a, a captain or a chief engineer to, to start the process, and this was just as a trial basis, to get a, a risk assessment um, developed by the onboard team, the results were pretty um, staggering. Um, 
uh, and highlighted the fact that there were not the best uh, place people to conduct this, which then leads back to the to the question of training, etc. But I'm 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 I stand uh, to be corrected, but I don't think there's any requirement for anyone to be certified by any uh, agency in the conduct of, of uh, cyber risk assessments. Correct. Correct to my understanding, but I would I would also encourage that um, those looking to procure that type of service ask the providers they're talking to what accreditations they have themselves, what makes them the specialist that they claim to be. Uh, it's all a bit cynical, but absolutely this is what this process is about to to not just be complacent to ask the questions and and have this start being um, a fabric of what 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 happens uh, within the industry that so far has been um, been lacking. Yeah, it's, it's kind of going back to uh, flag is a flag is a state at the end of the day, and the state cannot endorse the services of a private business entity, unfortunately. So we would all we would all be happy if that could happen, but there's rules and regulations uh, at the state level that doesn't doesn't allow that. Best we can do is provide the inputs that the state requires, that the international bodies provide provide uh, provide frameworks for them to use on both sides of the equation, and, and provide the best service as possible. Um. I think the final question, uh, because I know that time is pressing, and I think Vanessa and Maggie would be keen for me to uh, to draw the Q and A session um, to a close, so that we can move on to the next part of the the networking. But an interesting question has just um, cropped up here, and basically it's addressed to all of us. And the question is, uh, what is the current situation on cybersecurity insurance market? Are there any new tailored products around, or insurance providers are w still waiting and offering very general coverage? with lots of conditions in the small print. Um, I, I've had a chat with um, uh, some underwriters and they are still trying to assess um, the risk that this poses to yachts. And until they are clear in their own mind what is the actual risk, then I don't think we're going to see anything in terms of um, insurance, uh, tailored insurance covers or specific clauses in, in existing policies. Anybody else have a have a anything to add on this? Sure, that and <laughs> that's the million dollar question, Clive. Is the insurance piece of it? And the last month, I've spoken to the insurance underwriters group here in the United States and the International Underwriters Association out of London, where it was basically the largest insurance underwriters and brokers are trying to get a real handle on this from the maritime perspective of how do they classify that risk when it's on board. They've already kind of done it for the companies on the shore side, but the on board piece, I think the Norwegian club, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, may be the only insurance organization in the world that would consider um, any type of onboard uh, cybersecurity protection. Um, and, and they were doing that. It was actually a couple of years ago when I remember they were doing that, but most of the largest underwriters um, will not provide that coverage at this point until they get a better handle on, you know, what's happening. But I also think ultimately the insurance industry, um, you know, no offense to the flags, um, but ultimately the insurance industry could end up to be the driving force behind all of this. They could go and say, listen, this is what we want from the vessels that we want to insure and what we expect. And we don't care one way or another about IMO regulations. If you want us to insure your vessel, this is what you're gonna have to do. And it's not just gonna be cyber. I think it's gonna be the entire insurance to the vessel is gonna be rolled up. So I, I would be willing to bet that the insurance industry and the international underwriters and maritime are really gonna start to step up to the plate when they look at this to say, how can we insure a vessel? Cyber is gonna be one piece uh, of many parts of that. Perfect, thanks, Corey. Um, uh, I'd like to draw this um, session to a close, um, and as I said, move on to the next one. Um, I'd like uh, to do the, uh, the usual sort of thanks, because this sort of um, completes the formal part of, of this event. So thanks to the ISS and to Vanessa and Maggie for setting uh, this up. Thanks to uh, the panelists for, for the words of, of wisdom and experience, and we look forward to hearing them um, a bit more in the networking session. Uh, thanks to all the uh, participants, Good to see some questions and I hope um, the questions can continue um, and please ensure that you move around the tables when you get back to the lounge because that's when you'll get um, the maximum value. And finally, a huge thanks to the sponsors uh, for today's event, Directors uh, Shipyards and uh, Isotropic Networks.